The Power of a Father's Love is the title of my message tonight. The Power of a Father's Love. I'm speaking about the role of a father. Not just of a father, I'm speaking about the role of a leader, of a mother, of a single mother. I'm speaking about that. All of these principles can apply to any leadership role, whether in the home, in the church, in your workplace, in your community. The family is the first and most fundamental institution that God ordained in Scripture. Amen. God uses family, the family unit to transfer a spiritual legacy to the next generation, to impact the world for Jesus Christ. Sadly, most fathers do not carry out their God-given role to be the spiritual head of their family. Most have neglected the spiritual role and they usually leave it up to the church or others or sometimes it's as sad as it is that some of these young men and women go to the streets because they don't have that father figure in their, in their life, amen? So we need to have that father figure. A lot of kids from church homes attend public schools where most pagan teachers have the greatest impact on shaping the kids' thinking. How many of us know now, even on certain, and there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with sending your kids to a public school, but we have to be parents to teach our kids about the Gospel, to educate them, to fill their mind with the Gospel. So when they do go to the public school, they won't be influenced by the confusion of gender and different areas like this. There's kids that are thinking they're an animal. There's a terrible situation today where we have a massive percentage of single parents Single parents, homes, homes with major marriage issues, resulting in all sorts of problems. The devil knows the family is the backbone of the culture. The devil, is, the devil uses many ways to attack and destroy family unit, the family unit. There's nothing more important than our children knowing Jesus Christ. Proverbs 22 Six, it says, train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he grows old, he will not depart from it. Even when he grows old, he will not depart. Tonight, let's go through three important keys that I believe are necessary for demonstrating a father's love and to raising godly children. Point number one, church attendance is compulsory, not negotiable. In my family, when I got saved, church was necessary, not negotiable. My boys played sports, but if it was on a Sunday, they weren't to play. My boys, as they got older, worked on a Sunday. I said, the most important thing is, is you get to church on one service, at least one service. And that's what I encourage my kids, one service. If not, oh well, you're not working or you're not going to sports, or you're not playing sports. I put God first, and as we should do, because we don't wanna get into a generation where we start to allow all these things and the morals and the ethics start to slide away. And then all of a sudden, it's already starting to happen, where people are putting church second. But we need to remind our children, remind the younger generation that church is necessary. Hebrews 10, 24, 25 says, And let us consider how we must spur one another towards love and good deeds, not giving up on meeting together, as some of them are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, encouraging one another. This is what the Scripture's saying, so we can come together and gather, encourage one another, lift each other up. Amen? While my children were growing up, church was compulsory. We live by the Scripture. Everyone knows the Scripture in Joshua 24, 15. It says, but for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. Do not confuse serving in the house with your church attendance. Now, we have to have balance and prioritise things. People have heard some of the testimonies that I've shared that where my boys, my boys of my family is first. If I'm, there was, I think it was two years ago, I was out ministering someone, I had an appointment. And one of my boys were, were struggling, they were in a dark spot. And they rang me up and the moment, I, as soon as my boys know, if they ring me and they know I'm an appointment, I will answer my phone because I put my boys first. 
So I picked my phone up, I answered the phone, my boy needed me, I hung up and I told the person I have to go, it's my boy, I left and I went and see my boy and sorted the situation out. Okay, so this is what we have to do, we have to have balance. But we can't go too far the other way. (laughs) I see many a times when people get so involved in the church and serving in the church where it becomes they start to step back and they start to go too far the other way. If I went too far the other way, my boys wouldn't be where they are today or I wouldn't be where I am today. So you gotta have that balance. You gotta make sure you have that balance, amen? We have to keep that balance in it. Yes, we need to balance things. But one service a week is not negotiable. Why? Because what one generation finds optional, the next generation finds unnecessary. Very important. If you become the person that views church as optional, then your kids will grow up thinking that church is not necessary because their parents never prioritised it. We shouldn't, we, sh- we should not have the mentality of it's, it's church if there's no football on today. It's church if we can't go out in the boat. It's church if the weather's not great. We can't have that. We will start to produce a different mentality. We have to put God first. We have to, I love it when summer comes. Everyone knows when summer comes, the eight o'clock service you'll find will get a little bit bigger because it's hot. Everyone wants to go to the beach. Everyone wants to have fun. And what I love that families do come out, that's what I love about our church. We've got free services. We've got free services. You have free options. And this is what it's about. There is no excuse not to bring your children to church. There is no excuse. We have to keep that mentality. We have to keep our morals and ethics where church is necessary in this world. We have to teach the next generation so they can pass it on to their kids and then pass it on to their kids. This is what I see the saddest things in the church today. I see it coming down a little bit, but we have to rise up. Men, fathers, we have to rise up. We've got to stop being lazy. We have to continue to teach all these things that we're being taught within the church. The kids need to hear all this, amen? Amen. We need to keep it. I'll say it again. What one generation finds optional, the next generation will find unnecessary. I love this quote. I've got this quote down. Unless you fight to give your children what you didn't have, they're going to have to fight for what you didn't fight for. We need to be cycle breakers. We need to be cycle breakers. If you have a problem with lust, break it. Break the cycle. If you've got an addiction, break it. Fill yourself with the Word of God. Listen to your worship. Be at everything you can. When I came to church, when I got saved, when I got saved, I changed my life. I was at everything. You would see me at everything. It was, I think it was One Nations, All Nations. And then I would go and hang out with Roxy and the Romanians. And then I would go hang out here. And then I would go hang out there. I was everywhere because I changed my life. I changed from the world and I met a new family. And this is what we have to do. We have to, yes, there's a balance and I had to balance things, but I just wanted to change. I wanted God's people. I wanted to be like God. I wanna imitate God, amen. This is what it's all about. So we need to be cycle breakers, amen. Point number two, children have never been very good at listening. We know that. (laughs) They never be very good at listening, but they have never failed to imitate us. Can you imagine if I was still living the life I was living, the life, the drugs, the alcohol, violence, all these areas, as I'm going, my kids would start to do that. My kids would start to follow, but I I had to break the cycle. I had to change and give my kids a better life. And this is what it's about as men. We need to make that decision, decision to change, okay? We have to lead our wives. Amen, because that's what God has created you to be a leader. He has created you to be a man of God, amen. This is what it's all about. 
I am the priest at a home. Amen. Not in, not in a dominant or a dictating way, but in a guide, guard and govern way. A guide, guard and govern way. As men, you need to be careful you don't get it wrong and allow abuse in your home. What's the definition of abuse? This can be a whole message in itself. What's the definition of abuse? If you can put up the screen, Ed, did you, did you put it up on the screen? The, defini- the definition of abuse, I'll read it out. Abuse is the pattern of behaviour that uses fear or force to maintain power or control. That's abuse. That's abuse. Physical abuse, verbal abuse, to maintain control or power. I believe God hates abuse. I don't use the word hate much, but I believe God hates abuse. He hates it. He does not like it. We can go way back in Genesis uh, 6 3 when God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures for, for they have filled the earth with violence. Everyone say violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out along with the earth. Goes way back. And even in the New Testament, when Pastor Sean was sharing this morning, he used the example of one of the uh, disciples cut the ear off one of the soldiers. Jesus put it back on and healed him and said no to the, to the disciple. Even Jesus did not like abuse. He did not like violence. We have to love, we have to walk as the Father walks. Amen. We have to walk as the Father walks. My boys and now my girls see me in the most real state at home. They see me in the most real state at home. You can't be one way, one person at church and then another at home. You can't. Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 9 says, These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. This is what it's all about. Impress the Word of God in here. Educate your children and put the Word of God. I love it when we have family dinner. When we have family dinner at home, I think we have it once a week, sometimes it's twice a week because the young ones are on a tight budget. So they come over to Dad's. Dad will feed us. I love them. They're always open. Sometimes it's three times a week. But I love having my kids. We've got to make the most of it. Amen. Because now we've got uh, Chelsea's due to have a grandbaby. So we're excited for that new season. So we're praying favour that, you know, Bub might come tonight. Speak it in Jesus' name. Amen. (laughs) Speak it in Jesus' name. But what I love is when the kids come over, we have dinner. And then we'll, and after dinner, we'll play some cards or whatever. And And then um, next minute we'll start talking and we'll just start, next minute Jake will bring up a conversation about the Bible and then we'll go deep and then it gets deeper. And we open up, we've all got our Bibles open and we start to seek the Word and we start to have our opinions in a positive way. And we, we, this is what it's all about. This is how it is. This is how we meant to live. That's what the Scripture is saying. Amen. We have to do that. Children need guidelines and discipline. Amen. But what I do love is when, when uh, there was a time when my kids were growing up when I first got saved back probably the second year after I was saved, we started, I started getting the kids, and you should do it because they were only this big, and I got videos of Jake where we would, um, on a Saturday all week, we would pick, okay, Cooper, you have to um, get a message together. Just a short little 15 message. All week he'd get it ready. Saturday will come. We all sit in the lounge room. We got our Bibles open. And here's Cooper, this big, got his Bible open and he's looking at us and he's sharing. And he's sharing Scripture. And it's so innocent, but this is how I tried to teach me kids, stop playing cops and robbers or whatever, or gangsters or whatever things I used to play. But I taught me kids, no, this is what it's about. This is how we play things. And they, they did that. We did that for probably two years as they were growing up. They took turns every week. One of them shared. And then Jake shared. I got videos of it. So I remember when Caleb was this big and he tried it. And what happened, he had his thing and it fell on top of him. Then he cried his eyes and I got it all on camera. And he hates it. He hates it. The little pulpit we had, I forget what it was. It was some type of pulpit. But uh, we'll move forward. We'll move forward. Brings back memories. But we have to have guidelines and rules to shape the children into the right way of living. 
A loving father doesn't leave a children to raise themselves. One of the keys to raising godly children is explaining the why. The why. It is not wise to be, a, to be just dogmatic about rules without explaining the reason for the rules. For example, my, I never let my boys go to parties at all. Never let them go to parties after school, the end of the year, did not allow it. I'm the father and I will put them rules in place, but I had to explain to them. I didn't just say no, I explained them about the generational curse that's on me with the alcohol and the party in life and all that area. And I used different examples of other men and women that have fallen, that have fell back in the areas when the generational curse started to touch itself. So we ha- I had to explain to them, thank God today my boys will not fall. They've never wanted it. Where to the point to the, today, they come up to me and said, Dad, thank God you didn't let us go to parties. Amen. They respect it now because some of their mates that have finished school, they're going down a different path. So they were mates at school. So I always taught my kids, uh, preacher preached many years ago, I think it was Pastor Sean actually, bring them to your arena. Bring, don't go to their arena, you bring them to your arena. If I, like many years ago, I ministered to somebody who was a heroin addict. Okay, and you don't go to a heroin addict or alcohol, whatever. I don't go to a pub and meet the guy and then minister to the guy. You don't do that. You bring him to your arena, go to a coffee shop or go somewhere else. So I teach my kids to bring your mate to church or if they, if they come along or to a life group or something like that or invite them to youth. So this is what we gotta do. We have to bring them to our arena. It's not wise to be just a shared. For example, my boys never allowed to go to parties, which I just skipped. Wisdom says, learn from the experience of those who are gone before us. Amen? Our kids will imitate us. For instance, if your kids, I love when all the kids come down because they see everyone worship or the little ones, they're gonna imitate that. And we need to continue that. If I could encourage you tonight is to bring your kids down to the altar of a night service. Bring them down and let them see your worship because they will imitate that. If they see you praying, they're gonna pray. If they see you reading your Bible in the morning, they're gonna eventually bring their Bible out and read the Bible with you. But this is what we have to do. We have to teach healthy boundaries, amen? But imitation alone is not enough. Our kids can imitate our lives with hearts that are still far from God. A, Christ, a Christian parent's goal can't simply be Christian behaving kids. Ultimately, our kids must receive the gospel for themselves, amen? They need to receive the power. That's what I love about Kids Church in there. Carrie doing an awesome job in there. And there I heard all the excitement. I was in there this morning with Jaya and he was showing me some stuff and, and the new shop and the big slingshot they had in there. That was there. So, and all the kids were in there, but the, this is what I wanna encourage you. You gotta get your kids the kids' church, encourage you to go in there. And then this is where it all starts. My kids, if they didn't have kids' church, yes, they had me as the father of leaving, but kids' church was a massive impact in their life. They wouldn't be where they are today, where the spiritual laying on hands, praying in tongues, teaching them how to pray, lay hands on people. This is what it's all about. We have to fill our kids. Ultimately, our kids must receive the gospel for themselves, amen. Our children need God's grace and transformation. In Ephesians 5.1 speaks powerfully to parents. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. As we imitate the Father, as we follow God, our children will follow us as their Father. And this is what it's about. We need to imitate God. We need to be seeking His Word every day. Men, get into a habit. I teach men all the time, if you're because they're busy going to construction or whatever, get into a habit of reading your Word, not just reading it and rushing out the door. Actually sitting, having your coffee, write a little note on the table. If you forget, put it on, on your bench or whatever before you make your coffee and must read Bible and take my time and seek in the God's Word and read it. Because you've got to get yourself. So as soon as you come up in the morning, you see that note, that, that little note there, you're going to sit there, you go, oh, I better read my Word. And then you stop and read your Word. You've got to get, you do that until you get into a habit, okay? Do that until you get into the habit. Because we get into the habit of the busyness of life and different things and it distracts us 
from the Word of God. See, the enemy doesn't want us to read his Word. The enemy doesn't want us to stop and pray. But we have to be one step in front of the enemy. You know the group that I run in different areas where I teach the men to set their phone on the alarm if they're going out into temptation, if you're going into a place where you can't handle, set it. As soon as that alarm goes off, get out of there like Joseph did. Amen? Get out of there. Because this is what we have to do. So it's the same type of thing. We have to be in front of it. Our children need God's grace transformation. Amen? In Ephesians 4.32, God gives Christian parents try, uh, Christ, sorry. God gives Christian parents three trials to imitate. Imitate God's kindness. Imitate God's tenderness. Imitate God's forgiveness. Amen. We need to walk in tenderness. We need to be kind. We need to forgive quick. So it doesn't affect our heart. If the music team can come up. Point number three. The love of of a father is unconditional. God attaches no strings to His love. His love for us does not depend on our lovingness. It goes one way. As far as our sin may extend, the grace of our Father extends further. In loving us, God never gives up on seeking a relationship with us. Amen? He even sacrificed His Son on that cross for us. He took abuse. He took everything for us. So we said, so why are we being abusive? He took that abuse. Amen? So we need to walk in that lovingness. We need to not abuse our role as fathers. We need to love our wives. We need to guide our wives. Amen? This is what it's all about. God loves His internal. God's love is internal and nothing can ever separate it. Jeremiah 31, 3 says, I have loved you even an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued to extend faithful love to you. His love. We have to love like He loves. Amen. Amen. In the same way, our love for our children should be everlasting. Our arms should be a safe place for our kids to run to. When my son messes up, I don't want him to say, no, I don't want dad to find out. I want him to say, I need my dad. I need my dad. There's been many a times my sons and I've opened my arms and I've wept with my boys. I've wept with my boys. It's a powerful thing. Don't ever hold back on sharing a tear with your son. The enemy, wants, the enemy doesn't want you to be a proud for, don't show tear. He wants you to weep with him, encourage him in the right way, amen. Because he wants you to be a man of God, a man of God. But rather, I want them to say, I need my dad. 1 Corinthians 13, 7, 8 says, Love, love bears all things, believes all things, all, uh, endures all things. Love never ends. I love this quote. Billy Graham said this. I love this. A good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets of our society. It's not too late for you tonight, church. I didn't have a father. My earthly father wasn't around, but I found the father. And you can lead the same way. You can lead. You gotta be a cycle breaker. You gotta be the man to break it. So your kids don't have to fight it. Break it, guide them in the right way. Guide them in the right way. If you're here tonight, and you might not have had a father in your life, your father might have walked away, or you've had a father, but you don't know the father's love. You might know Christ. You might be here tonight and you don't even know the father I'm talking about. I'm talking about Jesus. You can get to the father through Jesus Christ. 
you can get to the Father through Jesus Christ. And once you get, go to Jesus and then get to the Father, God, He will guide you. He will teach you how to be a man. He will teach you how to walk. He will teach you how to talk. If you're open to giving your life to Christ. So right now, right now, if every head bowed right now, I want you to say this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. Direct me on Your path. I give my life to You tonight in Jesus' Name. Just simple. I give my life to You tonight in Jesus' Name right now. If you said that, I want you to lift up your hand right now. Lift up your hand. If you've said that, if you wanna know Jesus, the Jesus I know that changed your life, lift up your hand right now in Jesus' Name. Thank You, Jesus.